I'll be the heckler that you roast for into that popularity. All right, bet, dude. You're going to be Twitter fans. Twitter fans? I thought we should have Twitter fans. Dude, y'all have a lot of love. All right. Okay. So, Lauren asked me to speak about doubt. Originally, and now I'm going to be speaking about doubt and fear, which pretty much ties into my message because most of the time the reasons that we doubt is because of fear. We have fears about things and sometimes it's things that we realize and sometimes it's things that we don't realize. Sometimes it's things that's just snuck up on us and just, you know, in childhood or something like that. And it's not really something we think about until we look back on it. So. So to start off, what are some things that you guys have heard or some doubts that you guys have as Christians? So that's what my message is going to be centered about is doubts and fears that we have as Christians. Is there any doubts or any fears that any of y'all have heard or experienced or anything like that? Doubt, doubts that you know you're going to be okay and that God's got you and that everything's going to work out fine. My biggest fear is speaking in front of people. <laughs> uh, it's, it's the most terrifying thing I've ever had to experience in my whole life. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, I can swim with sharks all day long, but I can't speak because I can't speak right. because they're scared of me. Yeah, throw me in the lines then, but don't put me in front of a crowd of people. <laughs> yeah. So. That happens. That happens a lot. Some people that get stage fright. And I'm working on that now. Like, I said, talking to people, but as soon as people start laughing, I'm so scared. You're like, are you laughing at me? Or are you laughing at me? I just need them to laugh. If they're quiet, then I'm just all. Yeah, like, just like dead silent. You're like, like is everybody asleep? Like, if I am just talking to people, like, seriously, like, I'm scared. Like, I'm scared to talk to people. Like, I'm not just talking to people. Like, I'm Yeah. That's when you laugh really loudly at whatever you said, and then they feel pressure always in the back, you know. And I can only talk to like maybe ten plus people, so like either way, I'm done. Like, I don't want to be one of my major doubts for a very long time was that God would still do for me now what everybody says He did in the Bible, like that healing can still happen, or that like He can. He still like tangibly takes care of our needs. You know, I kind of thought that was like a, a thing, not an outcome. Let's get into that tonight a little bit. So, just for you. <laughs> Love it. All right. So, anyways, guys, I'm going to go ahead and dive into this tonight. I've got four points tonight, four doubts, four fears that most of us Christians go through. And I know there are definitely four fears and doubts that I've gone through in my journey so far. Anyways, so number one is I doubt that God is real. As uh, teenagers, as high schoolers, and when I went to high school, I experienced this as well. There's a lot of people in high school, they just, they don't share the same faith that we do. They don't, they're not raised up that way. They're not, they're not raised up going to church and they're not, they just don't. They don't have good parents and I'm not you know bashing parents or anything like that but they're just not raised up in that way and that's not their fault so but anyways so I had a um, I actually had an uncle one time and he was older he was raised in church there you go. but anyways my uncle he was raised in the church and um, he just he grew up knowing about God and everything like that, but he still had doubts, you know. And he, you know, he just there's some stuff that didn't make sense to him. I remember him saying, you know, how can you believe in a God that you can't see, you know? And I would say to him, you know, simple thing, you know, how the air that we breathe, you know, so how can you believe that, you know, there's air, if, you know, you can't see it. But also, I would go as far as to say, how do you know that there's, how how would you know that there's not a God that loves you, that there's not a God that died on the cross for you, and that there's not a Savior that is always there with you 
when I've seen so many miracles and so much done throughout history. Mm -hmm. so, so many things have been accomplished. So, so one person that you can probably think of in the Bible that doubted a lot was Doubting Thomas. So we're going to go to John chapter 20, verses 19 through 29. Sorry, I'll be distracting. I'm looking for my phone so I can have my Bible. John 20, 19 through 29. Mm -hmm. Sorry, backstory this is right after Jesus has just been resurrected from his crucifixion and it's when uh, Jesus is actually talking to Mary in the garden so. so anyways then the same day at evening being the first day of the week when the doors were shut where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews came Jesus and stood in the midst of them and saith unto them peace be unto you and when he said when he had said so said, he shewed unto them his hands and his side. Then were the disciples glad when they saw the Lord. Then said Jesus to them again, Peace be unto you, as my Father hath sent me, even so send I you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them, and saith unto them, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. Whosoever sins ye remit, they are remitted unto them. And whosoever sins ye retain, they are retained. But Thomas, one of the twelve, called Didymus, was not with them when Jesus came. The other disciples therefore said unto him, We have seen the Lord. But he said unto them, Except I shall see in his hands the print of the nails, and put my finger into the print of the nails, and thrust my hand into his side, I will not believe. And after eight days again his disciples were within, and Thomas with them then came to Jesus. The doors being shut, and stood in the midst, and said, Peace be unto you. Then saith he to Thomas, Reach hither thy finger, and behold my hands, and reach hither thy hand, and thrust it into my side, and be not faithless, but believing. And Thomas answered and said unto him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Thomas, because thou hast seen me, thou hast believed. But blessed are they that have not seen, and yet have believed. So Thomas, he doubted that, you know, that Jesus had risen from the dead. He, he doubted in God. So. Well, just reading that the other night, that's awesome. Really? <laughs> that's great. But that's what does sometimes. You know, sometimes we doubt unless we see something happen. Mm -hmm. Unless we see a miracle or something like that. And I'm going to go ahead and go into a little backstory of something that happened to me earlier this year. And for some of you guys that are in the church, you've probably heard this, probably, maybe not. But I uh, went through my own doubts this year. Uh, I don't know if you know my mom, but she got diagnosed with stage four cancer at the beginning of this year. And uh, that was back in January. And uh, as you can believe, a lot of doubts and fears popped up into my head, you know. And now I'm thinking, you know, I've got my whole life ahead with my mom and you know just thinking you know she's gonna be there on my wedding day and when I have kids and everything like that and then to have the thoughts that she's not gonna be there it's just it's tough it's like it, it hits you all at once like a train just coming through so I had some doubts and I had some fears and I had to really get on my knees and pray and just you know ask God about you know and just really get to get into his word and say, you know, are you for real? Can I trust you? And are you going to take care of my mom like I think you are? 
So we prayed for about me and my sister and my brother. We all prayed for her just every single day. Every single day we get together, we text each other and put some time aside and say, hey, we're gonna pray for mom. So it was just an ongoing process for four and a half months. Uh, she had, she did chemo, she went to the doctor every two weeks and uh, they drew blood from her and everything that a cancer patient goes through. And it was some very tough times. Uh, but uh, we kept the faith. Uh, we kept praying and we kept believing that God was going to do something. And that's really what faith is, guys. Faith is believing in something that you can't see. You know, you know. it says right here, you know, uh, Jesus said to Thomas, Because thou hast seen me, thou hast believed. Blessed are they that have not seen me and yet have believed. So Thomas, he had faith, but... Jesus said it's more, you're more blessed if you haven't seen the glory of God and you still believe that it's going to come. And that's what me and my whole family believed in. We believed that my mom was going to get cured and that she was going to get healed. And fast forward, four and a half months later, after she first got diagnosed, um, I remember we woke up that morning, we prayed as usual, you know, nothing special about it or anything like that. And uh, I remember it was a Sunday morning, and Mom said that she thought she was feeling better. And I was like, really? And she was like, yeah, I feel better than I have in a while. And at this point, you know, she was still stage four cancer diagnosed, so, you know, we, we didn't think anything about it. Uh, but uh, she actually went to church that morning, and uh, they was having altar calls, and she went down and got prayed for. And uh, there was a guy in her church that come up to her, and uh, he said, he sat down and he said, I feel like I have a word from the Lord for you. And you know, you know, some people they say, oh, I've got a word from the Lord for you, but it doesn't turn out to actually be one. But uh, this man, he come up to my mom, and he said, I know all these people are praying for you, but God has told me specifically that you're already healed. And you know, uh, that's a pretty big statement, you know, because, uh, you know, if something were to happen and you find out that, hey, well, God really didn't say that. But uh, as crazy as it sounds, my mom, uh, she went to the doctor the very next day and she walked in there and they was about to hook her up, do chemo, do, do her sixth treatment. I believe is what it would have been. And uh, the doctor come in the room right before they hooked her up, and he said, uh, you, you don't have to take this today. And my mom was like, are you sure? And he said, yeah, because uh, our PET scan turned back that you're completely healed. It's totally gone. That's <laughs> crazy. Just like that. So, so obviously we were happy, you know, and that, that really just spoke to me going back and thinking, you know, a lot of people say, well, miracles isn't something that happens anymore. Miracles is just something that happened back in the Bible days, but I've got a mom that's living and breathing today, and she definitely uh, had a miracle go on in her, so awesome. that's definitely something I could talk about, so anyways. I have, now, I've, I've, I've witnessed as many miracles myself, but I've also heard a few people try to, you know, with, I guess with their own doubts say uh, that the reason all the miracles happened back then and, and may not happen nowadays they try to say yeah. is because uh, it was it was there to fulfill you know the word it was meant to be in there for certain certain things I don't know how they try to describe it but, but I've definitely seen my share of miracles so. definitely yeah. all right. that, that book that Lauren gave me oh my Really crazy. Azusa Street. So good. We need oh, really? some, we need some oh, Azusa God. Street today. Yeah. <laughs> that was definitely awesome. So, the first one is that I doubt that God is real. The second one is I doubt that God hears me. I doubt that God, that God hears my prayers and that He cares about my prayers and that He 
cares about my needs. So, we're going to go over to Matthew 21, verses 18 through 22. Jesus perceived their wickedness and said, Why tempt ye me, ye, you hypocrites? Show me the tribute money, and they brought unto him a penny. And he saith unto them, Whose is this image and superscription? They say unto him, Caesar's. Then saith he unto them, Render therefore unto Caesar the things which are Caesar's, and unto God the things that are God's. And when they had heard these words, they marveled and left him and went their way. Okay, guys, I just read the whole wrong story, so back up. <laughs> okay, that was Matthew 22. Yeah, I was like, that's 22. Wait, wait, wait. Yeah, something's not right. Good catch, good catch. Okay, back in up. 21, 18 through 22. Now in the morning, as he returned into the city, he hungered. And when he saw a fig tree in the way, he came to it and found nothing there, but leaves only. And said unto it, Let no fruit grow on this tree henceforward forever. And presently the fig tree withered away. And when the disciples saw it, they marveled, saying, How soon is the fig tree withered away? Jesus answered and said unto them, Verily I say unto you, If ye have faith, and doubt not, ye shall not only do this which is done to the fig tree, but also if ye shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed, and be thou cast into the sea, it shall be done. And all these things, whatsoever ye shall ask in prayer, believing for it, ye shall receive it. So, on that... Sometimes we ask God for things, and I feel like sometimes we're not, we don't ask in the right mindset. I feel like we have we got a lot of doubts and a lot of fears, like we're talking about, and we just don't believe that God is going to do something. But guys, he says if you have faith as a mustard seed, you can say to the mountain, move into the ocean, and it'll be so. So I feel like we just have to. You have to have faith when you come to God. You have to mm -hmm. believe He's going to answer your prayers. And you have to be sincere. And just come to God as you are. You, you can pray to God. He, he doesn't care if you're mad. He says don't do anything in your anger. But we can come to God just exactly as we are. We can pray to Him. We can talk to Him just like you would talk to a father. Just like you would talk to your mother. There's nothing special about coming to Him. I know I used to have a youth pastor... <laughs> And he would say that if you only spend one minute of your day with God, that's better than going a whole day without even spending one minute with him. And then also he would go on to say, if you spend one minute with God, try to make the next day two minutes with God. So guys, I just encourage everyone, if you don't have a prayer life, just prayer is powerful. Mm -hmm. it, it can do many things. And some of you have seen the things that can happen when you have an effective prayer life. It can be super powerful, super life changing. Can I read a commentary really quick on that verse that he yes. just read? My, my translation is a little bit different, but the commentary says that we need to note that Jesus taught his disciples that if faith's fullness lived in them, that they could speak to the physical creation around them and that it would respond. That faith unlocks the great authority of a believer. 
But what I think is interesting is that when you take it to the original translation, it says everything you pray for with the fullness of faith, which means that faith grows. And the Bible says that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So if you want more faith to be able to believe and not doubt and not have fear, the only way to get that faith is to hear the word of God. And so when he's saying you've got to spend that time with God, faith doesn't develop any other way. And when our faith develops to its fullness, it literally says that the physical creation around us responds, and that's pretty amazing. Mm, that is pretty awesome. Also, a lot of people think they, for some reason, they think they have to be holy enough to pray to God. You've got to be holy enough to pray to Almighty God. And that's just so false, guys. It's just so false. If you remember the story of the Pharisee and the tax collector, the Pharisee, he was all about himself. Mm -hmm. he, he just he thought about himself, he thought about his needs, and it didn't really matter about anybody else or anybody that was struggling around him. He went to the temple to pray, and the whole time that he was praying, he was just buffing himself up, busting himself up, making himself look good, just really prideful. He came to God, and he prayed in a prideful manner. And then we see that, and, and what he said was, I'm, I thank you, God, for not making me like that tax collector over there. And then the tax collector, we hear that he has a different prayer. Mm -hmm. His prayer is a little more humble. It's a little more sincere. All he can do, he can bow his head and uh, beat on his chest and say, Lord, forgive me, for I'm a sinner. But you notice at the end of that story, the Pharisee, he didn't get favor from God, but actually the tax collector did. So, A lot of people reach a point where they think, after all the bad things that I've done, that God just can't love me anymore. That's just not true. Mm -hmm. yeah, Guys, that's, that's, for sure. that, that's actually so true what Colton said. I just got done last week talking to a, to a friend of mine. He's, he's 40 years old, though. And uh, his question was, to me, he, he messaged me on Facebook. He said, Dalton, uh, do you think, he, he said, I've gotten into church, I've, you know, I'm, I'm doing things better, I'm trying to live right, and I'm, you know, I've got a, uh, got a girlfriend with a kid now, you know, and I'm trying to raise them up in church and everything like that, but he said, I want to ask you a question, and he said, do you think that after everything that I've done, because he has a past, like we all do, he said, after everything that I've done, do you think that I can come to God and do you think that he will hear me? And I said, dude, he, he hears every single one of us. I'll be straightforward with you. There, there's nothing that you can do that will ever separate you from the love of Christ. Does he call us to repent? Yes, he does. As his children, he wants everyone to come to the repentance. He wants everyone to come to the feet of Christ. But does that, does that ever mean that he's ever going to stop chasing you? That he's ever going to stop loving you? It doesn't. It doesn't, guys. So you don't have to be holy enough. You don't have to be greater than thou to have a prayer life with God. See, that was what the Pharisees preached. They thought, hey, you know, only, only the high officials in the church, only they can come to God. But Jesus, he come, he set the plane straight. He died. He said, no, everybody can come to me. It's not just the people that think they're worthy. It's not just the people that think they're better than everybody, the religious people. Every single one can come to me. Do y'all know who the Pharisees and the Sadducees were? Like, do you know what they were? Mm -hmm. Like, do you know what they believed? Like, what the different groups were? And, and their mirror of now? Yes, no, maybe? No, not now? Okay. So Pharisees and Sadducees were both religious people. Like they were the higher ups in religion, but they had a difference of belief. So a Sadducee was like your super strict legalistic church leader, right? Like it's all the law, you do this or you burn in hell, like, you know, that kind of thing. The, the Pharisees were like the opposite end, kind of like our new age. Like they believed in the Mosaic law because that was all they knew and they, knew, they believed in right from wrong, but they also believed that a person could determine for themselves what was right or wrong, right? Which is the same thing we deal with now. We've got super strict legalistic people and then we've got other people who have a form of spirituality where they get to determine what's right and what's wrong. And so when we read the New Testament and we hear Jesus condemning the Pharisees and the Sadducees, he's not condemning a holy group of people. 
he's condemning legalism and being your own God. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And so when I used to read the word, I was really confused because I would be like, well, these are supposed to be like the church folks. Why is he calling them sons of snakes? Like, that just didn't make sense to me. But when you look at the, the polar opposite ends of the spectrum from Jesus and the message that he preaches, that's why he talks about, like, the legalistic prayer, like, reciting ritual prayers. But he also warns us against determining that we are our own judge, our own God. Nobody judges me but me. I get to decide my own my own rules. And so the Pharisees and the Sadducees, we can pretty much stack those up against, like, super churchy and new age when we're reading the Bible. And that kind of helps give you some perspective on why Jesus calls them out the way he does. That's pretty cool. I've never heard them compared like that. Yeah, so it's pretty awesome. Like, yeah. it, it, it really helps me in perspective because, you know, we hear a lot of different things, especially when we're talking about doubt and fear and we're talking about, um, you know, the, just the reality of there were times that I doubted that God was real after he had healed me from a mass in my stomach. Like, that's ridiculous, right? Like, I show up with a mass this big in my stomach, and then I go back and it's not there. And I'm like, well, maybe that was... Even we have, like, when we have doubts after God shows himself to us, when we're looking at, like, and, and trying to determine, do y'all ever feel like you can't, like, maybe if you hear something from somebody, you'll take it as truth, and maybe it's not truth. Like, we kind of doubt ourselves when we're deciding what's right about the Bible. But I have that doubt for myself a lot. Keeping those two things in mind helps me keep it in the middle. Like, if somebody's being super legalistic, I go look at what Jesus said to the Sadducees. If somebody's being super like all inclusive and there's no, no such thing as sin and I get to determine what's right and I get to determine what's wrong, then I look at what Jesus said to the Pharisees and it helps me find the middle ground. So it's pretty good for study. Oh yeah, definitely. And branching off of what Lauren said, I don't call out different religions or different denominations, but guys, there's a lot of churches that they preach that pretty much you have to be perfect to make it to heaven yeah. and that you still have to work your way to heaven when they say that, I'll definitely point them to Ephesians 2, 8 through 9 that says it's not by works that you're saved, it's by grace alone yeah. and faith in Jesus Christ, your Absolutely. Lord and Savior. So, I, I really don't know why they think that, but there's a lot of people out there that they're, they, don't, they don't mean to harm others, but they end up doing it in the long run. So, and that's the last thing we want as believers is to harm, hurt anybody and not want them coming back to our church. So. Amen. So the that was point number two. I, my doubt in God and a God that's real. Number three, I doubt that God sees me, sees me and cares about me. So have you ever thought that hey maybe I know uh, there's been some people that I'm a, I'm a real big football fan and I love football. I love any type of sport, but definitely football more than everything basketball too that's safe but anyways there's a lot of people that have told me that well yeah you love football but God really doesn't care about football he, you know he doesn't really care about your life he just cares whether you serve him or not so I'm going to tell a story real quick and I don't know if any of you guys know him but uh, Tim Tebow has anybody heard of Tim Tebow before yep Tim Tebow is probably one of my favorite football players and not just because he's a great football player, but also he's a great representation of what a Christ-like Christian and what a true leader should be. So for those of you that don't know Tim Tebow, he's a football player for one, and he played for Florida back in 2007 to 2010. Yeah, 2007 to 2010. And he was their quarterback. And uh, back then, it's not legal now in the NFL or in college football, but you were able to wear face paint on your face. Like you could write a little message on your face or just draw a line, a black line or a white line or something like that just to, you know, express yourself. Well, Tim Tebow, he would uh, get up there on game days and he would write John 316 across his cheek because, you know, he wanted to know show people hey you know I'm a follower of Christ I, I play football but still God is number one in my life so and a lot of people they got really mad at Tim Tebow they said uh, well maybe if you spend as much time 
trying to play football as you did trying to, you know, uh, practice your religion or express your religion, maybe you'd be good at it. <laughs> That's kind of crazy to say because he actually went on to win two Heisman trophies there. But anyways, <laughs> so yeah, just horns down. But anyways. So yeah, Tim Tebow, he got a lot of hate just because he expressed uh, his faith in Christ. And also, if you've heard about it, he's the one that started the Tebow thing. He was the one that after he made a touchdown, he prayed to God and or just, you know, did the Tebow thing. So. But anyways, so uh, he did that in 2009. And in 2010, college football actually said, you can't do that anymore. They said, you can't write anything on your face and you can't express your religion or anything like that. That was in college football. Fast forward, I think, three years later, yeah, exactly three years actually, Tim Tebow is playing for the Denver Broncos. He's a starting quarterback for the Denver Broncos and they're playing the Pittsburgh Steelers. And it's actually a wild card game. The Broncos, they didn't have too hot of a season that year, so the wild card game, it's for the teams at the end of the year that they give you a chance to make the playoffs, but they put you up against the number one team and probably not going to win that one. Usually, you're not supposed to win that one. They just pretty much get an extra game in there for them before the end of their season. So anyways, everybody was picking the Steelers to win that game. Everybody thought that you know the Steelers wouldn't have any problem with Broncos and you know they're gonna go on to the championship next week. So anyways, in the NFL it actually hadn't been outlawed that you can't write anything on your face yet. That was just in college football. So Tim Tebow, he's going out there for the wild card game and he actually decides that he's gonna bring back the John 316. And so he wrote that on his face for the Pittsburgh game, John 316. So anyways, uh, long story short, uh, Tebow, he goes out there and probably plays his best game of his life in my opinion. And they actually end up beating the Pittsburgh Steelers, I think in the last seconds of the game. I think they did like a last minute touchdown pass from Tebow. And I believe one of his receivers caught it in the end zone. They actually ended up upsetting Pittsburgh that night. And it was a big win. Uh, he pretty much proved all the sports announcers wrong and just everybody. But anyways, the coolest thing about the game is, so he wrote John 316 on his face to you know, represent his faith and uh, show that he was a follower of Christ. So after the game, what they do is they've got stats. They, they do the stats on everything. The time that the other team had the possession, the uh, passing yards, rushing yards for that game, just every little detail. So after the game, one of the reporters comes up to Tebow and he's like, uh, do you realize what just happened? And you know, Tebow's looking at him and he's like, well, no, I guess I don't. Uh, what are you talking about? And he said, uh, did you, did you uh, understand the stats that hap uh, after the game? And he said, no, what do you mean? So let me give you some of Tim Tebow's stats that night. Or just or the team stats, my bad. So that night, Tebow, Tebow's passing yards, which is actually an NFL record that he set that night, his average passing yards, and I'm talking about like average completion, right? Like that's how many yards that he got for completion. He averaged 31.6 completion passing yards that night. <laughs> and also, uh, the uh, the Pittsburgh Steelers, the time of possession that they had the ball that night, it was 31 minutes and 6 seconds. <laughs> we can't, we can't make that up. That's awesome. <laughs> it doesn't stop there. The average rushing yards that Tim Tebow had that night when he did his quarterback sneaks, he averaged 3.16 yards per carry. It gets better. <laughs> also, Jesus was like, I played that game. Right. <laughs> no, okay. It's, it's, you know how okay game where you just do, 
that that was Jesus that night. Yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> but anyways, he he did that and That's crazy. yeah, that is crazy. You can look it up. It's Love really it. awesome. Uh, Tim Tebow, John three sixteen. Man. But anyways, uh, so a lot of people ask, does God care about my personal life? Does God does He care about me? Does He care about the things that I go through? And does He care about the the struggles that I go through. I think that you can tell right there that God is very into your life. And he's very interested in your life. Just like Tim Tebow, how, how God showed that he was with him in that game. He showed his glory in that game. And also, the best thing about that game that I didn't tell you is uh, there was the, the next morning on Twitter and Google, there was a there was a trend that was going on, you know, how people make up words and they become trends. Uh, the number one trend was actually John 3.16, and over 90 million people looked up that verse just because of Tim Tebow playing that game, and they heard about his stats that night. So just think about that. Just because of one selfless act by one person just writing a simple scripture on his face, 90 million souls got reached that night through Christ. 90 million people heard the gospel of Christ just because of one man. Oh, God. I love this. <laughs> I'm moving my toes in the air. They're going to show there's all different kinds of ways to reach It may not be, you know, not everybody has to be the greatest preacher mm -hmm. to reach. To reach. <laughs> All right, and my last, uh, my last point that I have for tonight is I doubt that God loves me. And that's a tough one. That's a tough one. There's some times that we feel disconnected from God. We feel like we do so much and that we have so much sin in our lives and we feel that disconnect from them. We don't feel like we can, like I said uh, in point two, uh, I, doubt that God uh, I doubt that God cares about me. You know, sometimes we feel like we can't come to him and sometimes we feel like he doesn't hear us. So I'm going to give you all one more story for the night and we're going to close this out. And it's about Tim Tebow again because I love Tim. <laughs> so anyways, after Tim Tebow retired from uh, NFL football, right now he's a sports show talk host. He gets on there and talks about college football and gives the picks and everything and who he thinks is going to do good for the year and who he thinks is going to win the games, uh, the tight close games of the year. But also, Tim Tebow, but you might not know about him, he does a prison ministry. He goes around to different prisons and he witnesses to people and specifically on people that's on death row. He feels like uh, if the last thing that somebody should hear about before they're dying is the gospel of Jesus Christ to give them one more chance to get their life right and get their life settled. So, Anyways, I believe this story took place in Texas and I'm not sure what town it was in but so Tim Tebow He's got a group that goes around with him, and they do prison ministry. I believe it's about four or five people that goes with him. And anyways, they went to a prison in Texas that day, and they got there early in the morning. I think it was like 8 in the morning or something like that. And there was 44 people that was on death row that day. 44 lives that Tim Tebow had a chance to impact. Well, he said that... Uh, they preached to 44 people, you know, talked to them and everything right before they was about to die. Yeah. And uh, they talked to 44 people, and out of those 44 people, they said only one felt like, you know, hey, yeah, maybe I should, maybe this Jesus thing, maybe this Jesus guy, maybe he is for real. So out of 44 people, only one person wanted anything to do with it. Only one person wanted to, you know, hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. And as you can imagine, that's really upsetting. That's really 
sad and I'm sure Tim Tebow was heartbroken, you know, putting all that work in and, you know, only one person wanted to hear what he had to say. So anyways, I got there at 8 o'clock in the morning and I think it was 6.30 once the last prisoner was executed. So anyways, you know, Tim Tebow's had a long day. He's probably ready to go home and, you know, just forget about, you know, everything that just happened. And uh, as they're walking out the door, he notices that there's a hallway, like a very long hallway, that he didn't notice when he first come in. And uh, so they're walking by, and uh, one of the guys that's with Tim Tebow, he says, what, he asked one of the prisoner guards, he's like, what's down that hallway down there? And they say, well, that's for the, the high-risk people, like the people that we, that, like, People that don't get any visitors, no phone calls or anything like that. They're just isolated and incubated in this one small tiny room and they don't even have like a window that they can look out of. So the only thing they can do is hear their voice when they're talking. And uh, one, of the guy, and one of the guys asked Tim Tebow if he would like to go, uh, hold on, backtrack. So the guy asked him, he said, uh, how many people's down there? And the guy said, there's three people down there three people in a room and uh, one of the people one of the people with Tim Tebow asked would you like to go down there and you know witness to them and Tim Tebow's like man you know we just we witnessed the 44 prisoners and you know honestly it seemed like none of them wanted anything to do with me so you know I'm, I'm kind of just tired I'm ready to go home ready to get something to eat you know we've been here all day long and the guy says no man you know let's let's go down here you know you never know what can happen so Tim Debo, he finally agrees to go down there, and he finally agrees to, you know, go and talk to these people. So the first person that Tim Tebow comes to, first one on the uh, on the list, he uh, he talks to him and you know tries to you know talk to him about Christ and everything like that, and didn't want anything to do with him. So moves on to the second cell. Same thing, he talks to the guy, opens up to him, tries to share a message with him, and still to no success. Uh, just didn't want anything to do. So Tim Tebow, he finally gets to the third and the final door, and he's like, really, I don't even want to try, you know, I've, at this point, you know, I'm just ready to go home. But anyways, Tim Tebow, he starts talking to the guy, and uh, he goes up there, and he says, uh, hey, sir, can I talk to you real quick? And uh, the guy says, who is this? And Tim says, this is uh, Tim Tebow. He said, uh, I wanted to talk to you about Jesus Christ. And I wanted to talk to you about him being your Lord and Savior. And uh, the guy uh, started crying. He started weeping and Tim Tebow could hear it. And he said, you know, I haven't had a visitor in 20 plus years. Said, I was actually, I was actually praying to God earlier for the first time that I have in a while, Tim Tebow. And he said, if you wouldn't have come when you did, he said tonight I was gonna kill myself. He said I was gonna hang myself. I was gonna, I was gonna be done with it because he said I've been here in here 20 years. I've had no visitors, nothing, and I was just hopeless. I didn't have any hope, so, and uh, Tim Tebow got to talking to him, and he got to saying, you know, man, uh, I want to talk to you about Jesus, I want to talk to you about, you know, what kind of faith you can have in him, and uh, he said, no matter what you've done, um, you know, Jesus loves you, and he wants all of his children to come to repentance, and he wants everybody to accept him. And uh, that man, he ended up accepting Christ that very same day that Tim Tebow talked to him. And that just goes to show, like I said again, just how one humble act and one simple gesture of obedience to God, because he didn't want to do it, but he did it anyways. And it just shows you how when you do when you do what God tells you to do, he can definitely work things and he can definitely do things in your life. Kind of tore it, man. I can tell you, done it again, but the discouragement that he, he must have went through, you know. Oh, yeah. 24 people in one. It's a long day.
doing anything for dinner after this? Huh? Are we doing anything for dinner after no, this? No, I figured I'd starve you to rise to real life. Okay. Well, I only have you for another two years before you leave for college. Or leave you for the afterlife because you've been starving me for two years. So. Yeah, we won't make it two years. I guess that's the truth. Um, all right. So we'll we'll pray before we switch the we already let let out downstairs. So we'll go down there. Rob, you want to take us out? Yep. Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this night, Lord. We just thank you, Lord, that we can come together as one group of believers, Lord, and that we can hear your message, Lord, and that we can just have our hearts open, have our minds open, have our ears open, Lord, and just receive, Lord, what you, what you speak to us through your Holy Spirit. Father, I just thank you for this night. I just thank you for all of these young, young kids in here, Father. I just pray, Lord, that you would bless them throughout the school year, Lord. I pray, Lord, that you would bless them in their individual lives, Lord. And I pray, Lord, that you would just touch every single one of them, Lord, and just let them know, Lord, that you want that personal relationship with them, Father. It doesn't matter what they're going through. It doesn't matter how hard of a time they have right now, Father. At the end of the day, you just want to hear from them, Lord, and you just want to touch them, God, exactly where they're at, Father. So, Lord, I just pray, Lord, that through your Holy Spirit, Lord, that you would speak to them, Father. They would open up to you, Lord. They they would just have a genuine relationship with you, Lord. Jesus, we just ask these things in your holy, precious name. Amen. Everybody, got your phones. Get the address. For yep. Friday. That's right. I don't know if you have that. I didn't know that. I want to see something funny. I'll do. I need to get it to you because I I don't have it. I've actually got a book of ten feet. I only actually talked about that story. It's called This Is the Day, I believe. <laughs> Yep, so my address is 437 Palm Street, Alburn, North. Okay, I think it's Friday. Pause. We're ready. Pizza and food. I didn't hear you say it. 437 Palm Street. Oh, I thought you were saying You're right, the are hilarious. That's totally fine, because we'll, we'll meet you at six. She's going to have to text him about my driving, because well, I drive like way. Job. And it's a long way, and it's dark, and people drive stupid, so I get that. But we may be practicing until like 8.30, like whatever we got to do, because we're doing some new stuff. So whatever, just kind of let her know it might be late, so we can get that in Florida. All right, I'm going to go meet with Wendell. Bye, Mom! <laughs> Hey, don't forget your phone. Oh yeah, I'm getting it. <laughs>